Chris Harder, welcome to the show. My brother, and I mean that when I say my brother, you are literally a freaking brother to me. Uh, you know, what people don't know is you and I got to hang out for a long time yesterday when I jumped on here. I'm like two days in a row, I'm blessed. And that's how I feel, man. So thanks for having me on. You are so welcome. You know, it's, it's a special treat for me because like you just said, you're a friend, you're a brother, um, you're a role model. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this. This is sort of going to be a part two uh, for us because we've done a part one um, about your background and who you are and how you, you know, went from the mortgage world into, you know, network marketing and to creating your own brand and, and a lot about Lori and all that stuff. So that will live. Um, we'll link up in, uh, in the show notes. That episode will live there. So um, today, what I'd like to cover is how you are looking at the world differently now since we last spoke. This, um, mm -hmm. this year has been, um, there's been a lot of stuff for all of us. There's been a global pandemic. There's been racial in it equality. There's been a, and still is at the recording of this, a heated presidential race. Um, and, and you had all of that. You experienced all of that. But plus, you experienced the, uh, the tragic and unexpected death of your dad. Can you walk us through? And, how and our dog. And our dog was like a, a child to us. And I'm not comparing my dad to our dog. But for context later, when I say this has simultaneously been the most effed up year and the best year at the same time, it'll, it'll make sense. Yeah, for sure. I was right there with you with uh, with Waffles going through that. Mm -hmm. That was um, that was tough. So with all of that, um, I, I guess what I'd like to talk about today is because I think everybody is experiencing, you know, we all go through life and we experience life. I lost my dad, too. And I remember what that felt like. But but I didn't lose it. I didn't lose him during this the craziness that is going on on all different fronts. And I didn't lose him, you know, losing my dog at the same time. You had a perfect storm of everything thrown at you all at the same fucking time. Yeah, so, all in the first half of the year. In the first half of the year. So I, I guess what I want to ask you and, and just answer these questions really however you want, um, whatever feels right for you, but how, what did you learn from the experience? What was it like going through that? What are you doing differently, differently now? Like, just talk me through sort of where your head is. You know, I'll start with this. Um, when my dad died, one of the very first thoughts, and I literally mean one of the very first thoughts in this wild, like rush of emotions, you know, it's, it's like, it's not real when it happens, right? When you're finding out and all that. When he died, one of my first thoughts was, I am so grateful that we were so intentional, and I'm gonna use the word hyper-intentional, about creating memories, spending time together, and making our relationship a priority. And I'm gonna add some color around that in a minute. Because in the first couple hours of realizing, holy shit, my fucking dad is gone, I realized at least I didn't leave anything on the table and I'm not going to live this life of I waited too long or I should have or I could have. My only regret was that he didn't live longer. He's taken way too soon. Super healthy guy. You knew him really well. Um, and so that was something that I latched on to to help me get through it was we brought them out here every single winter. Not in our house. That would be nuclear, but seven blocks away and um, created, you know, invested in bringing them out here for five months and created memories every single year. And then we went up back home to Wisconsin where they live two, three times a year, created memories. We, the seemingly insignificant bike rides in the morning when I wanted to be working out instead, if I'm really being truthful, the seemingly insignificant lunches when I could barely fit them between meetings, the fairly, or the seemingly insignificant um, you know, uh, evening dinners when I was already exhausted and I just wanted to have my own evening routine on the couch, but went to dinner anyways. All of those things, making those a priority and, and not backing out of those had the, the most infinite value you could ever imagine. And now I get to look back, pictures, videos, memories, all these things. I feel like I squeezed every last drop out of that relationship. And so if I could open with any point, it would be, Drop what you're doing, 
make your loved ones, friends or family, make your loved ones an absolute hyper intentional priority because there's going to be a day where that's either going to be what you're able to latch on to and process this real well, or there's going to be a day where you realize, holy shit, I always thought I had more time and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. You're literally fucked at that point. Yeah. Like, you know, in life, there's these moments that happen and, you know, they call them flashbulb moments, right? And, you know, where were you when 9-11 happened? Where were you when, you know, the president was shot, all that stuff. And I remember being up uh, in the mountains with you uh, in Big Bear and we're just having a great dinner, a great time laughing and Next morning, I'm home and I get a text from you. Um, I just chartered a debt, a jet, my dad passed. And I was, I mean, obviously getting a text like that, I'm like, what, how, how, like, and it's, it was, it wasn't, he's sick. It wasn't, uh, I'll have to figure it out. It was, he's gone. What was that moment like for you being on that plane knowing what just happened. You know, the plane ride was probably four hours and it felt like it was four minutes. Mm. And um, I can't remember a lot about the plane. We were in a private jet. Um, My wife and I, my brother and his girlfriend, Jackie, and our two dogs. And all I remember is landing a friend of my parents, Ian, picking us up at, on the runway there and going home and, and seeing my mom and she wasn't even, she couldn't even talk. Like, I didn't even know if she knew that we were there or not. She was hugging us, but she was so beside herself. I didn't even know if she like fully realized that we were there or, or not. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you intentionally block those things out of your memory or if you're just so distracted that you don't really remember a lot about them. But I remember thinking, now what? Like everything that we thought we had planned out in life suddenly was irrelevant. It was like super irrelevant. And something switched for me when dad died, probably a couple of weeks, you know, into after he passed, you know, we, we stayed there. We had the funeral. We actually stayed seven weeks at my mom's place in Wisconsin um, to help her get situated. And during those seven weeks, a lot changed for me, Rob. And you and I at lunch yesterday, we were, t- we we're kind of talking about it. Like, here's the punchline. This year has simultaneously been the worst year of my life and also the best year of my life. And, and I have trouble reconciling how that can happen. I actually have guilt around saying, yeah, this year my dog died, my dad died. There's been social unrest where the rioting on my street literally pushed us up to the mountains because it was dangerous to be in our home. And then on top of that, COVID hit lockdown everywhere. But if you lived in LA, you were actually extra, extra lockdown, like draconian. And how can all of that happen and still end up feeling like I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I've had the best year I've ever had. And when I look back on it, I'm actually trying to dissect the mechanics of why that is. And here's why I think it is. <clears throat> My dad was happy from the time he woke up to the time he went to bed. Happy was his default. And in our last episode, we talked about, yes, why am I happy? Uh, A lot of it was from my dad and another gentleman, Mark Spiker, who died too young. And I decided not in a moment, there was not a a time where I'm like, I'm deciding going forward, I'm doubling down on my happiness. But somewhere subconsciously, I decided in those those several weeks back home where I was just not going to do anything that didn't make me happy anymore. And so what did I do? I went out and I bought a motorhome and I decided we're hitting the road. And I started saying no. One of my weaknesses that resulted in unhappiness was I would just say yes to, to helping too many people do too many things out of being kind. And the problem is my quest for kindness to make other people happy was making me unhappy. I was too busy. Every single day I woke up back to back to back to back to back. You know how it was. And I said, no more, fuck it, I'm done. And I've literally started living my life based on what do I want to do? How much space do I want to have? And I don't give a shit. My I don't give a shit muscle 
is like I in, took every steroid on the planet in those seven weeks, because now I literally don't give a shit about making other people happy if it's at the expense of me being happy. And now I don't want people to take that out of context. Don't stop the sentence with, I don't give a shit about making other people happy. You better play the whole fucking sentence when I say, I don't give a shit about making other happy, other people happy at the expense of my happiness anymore. And so my no muscle has gotten huge. I don't say yes to, to all these one-off calls. Can you help me with this? Can you help me? With no, because they're, they're, they were chipping away at my happiness, at my space. And so everything we're doing now, down to getting rid of this place, moving to another state, everything is about creating more space and only doing the things that I know will make us happy with a side effect of success. You know, it's interesting because um, you had uh, turned me on to, uh, to, to a great guy named Rory Baden, and um, he was pulling out of me, what is the message? And he said, he kind of like, he, he said something that you just said. He said, if you can grab somebody by the neck and you can shake them and you would say to them, if you would just fucking get this, mm -hmm. what would those words be? And I said, to do more of the things you love and less of the things you don't. Yeah. And that is the messaging that I live by. And you just said that beautifully. And you know, it's interesting because you are the kind of guy that would literally give anybody the shirt off their back and all you want for them is to have success. And simultaneously, uh, as your audience grows and the people reaching out to you gets larger and larger, your ability to to stay in alignment with those values then because starts to get eroded into you not living a life that you want. So it's like this quite literally uh, conflict in your values. So I, I bet that that was a struggle for you um, to do, but you're doing it beautifully. And I wanted to talk to you about this next stage of your life, which is um, you take that schedule and move it to you sitting behind the wheel for eight hours. Yeah. And not being able to do any of that, because I know that that load, that that workload, that scheduled load had to go somewhere. How did you make all of that happen? You know where it went? You know where it went? It went to fuck off. I'm not doing it. And I'm not. Even <laughs> kidding. Like, no, it was a band aid. I want people to understand. I want people to understand. I want people to understand. If you're like, well, I'm going to slowly start unwinding this down. No, you're not. Not going to happen. It was a band aid. It was cancel my shit. I'm going to choose which relationships and which things I want to preserve and not burn down. And the rest of it, I'm doing me. It was tearing off the, the band-aid. My word for 2021 and going forward is space. I want more space. We're changing our whole business model so that we have more space. We're changing where we live so that we have more space. Um, we see this whole nation as our space that we get to play in now that we have this bus. I, my word for 2021 is more space, less commitments. And had dad not died, I wouldn't have had the nuts to follow through with saying no. Cause here's the problem. You alluded to it before. I reach a point in my life where I'm not making choices between good decision, bad decision. I'm making all these choices between two, having too many good people in my life and too many good opportunities in my life. And they're all great things to say yes to. And that makes it harder to say no. And without dad dying, I would have had the nuts to say no to it. I would have just kept working myself into an oblivion because they were legit things to say yes to. And when dad died, that switched. And now I am only saying yes to things that fit outside of this container that I'm building called space. So you know how they say when you want to actually start creating some, some real net worth that you got to pay yourself first and live on what's left over. I'm creating the space first. And I'm living what, on, on what's left over. And I've always done this. If you think about with my protected time in the mornings and my evening walks with Lori, this is just taking it to like a whole new level. This is like taking it from the third floor to the hundredth floor. I just got it. I did not understand why, frankly, because it's not something that's attractive for me but I did not understand why you were as passionate and all in on an RV. And I just got it because you just gave me the lens that you're operating from, which is space. Yeah. So now here you are in the middle of America in your own bubble, in your own world, in space that is forced separation. It's forced thinking time. It's forced connection with yourself time um, that was 
well needed. It's kind of like when you see, you know, some celebrity that moves from Beverly Hills to Idaho and you go, what the fuck? Like, why are you like, it's because of the same reason they need to get out and they need some space. This is interesting. I want to talk to you about that space. Um, I know that one of the the new products that uh, you and your wife, Lori, are going to be working on is uh, working with couples. And, you know, every couple, um, you know, uh, has their shit, has their challenges and, you know, trying to figure out how to make it work. And I love my wife. We get along great. But I wonder how being, I'm going to use my word, cooped up in a bus or an RV for as long as you guys are alone together, does that make you closer, further away, present new challenges? What's that experience like? It's made us closer. Here's why. A couple things. Uh, one, first and foremost, when you drive for eight hours, something that big, you have no choice but to be hyper present. It is so big that you just have to be present on what you're doing and make sure that you're not, you don't drive a bus. You just avoid crashing the bus. That, that's the difference. And so I'm so present that she sits over in the, the, the co-captain's seat to my right, and I'm not on my phone. Nobody can get a hold of me. I'm not nothing. And so we have nothing to do but talk and dream and hang out. This is, it was in those bus seats where we remodeled our life. It was in those bus seats where we decided that we're moving and no one in the world knows where we're moving to, but I'll tell you on this show, this will be the first place to know. Um, nobody or, or is in those bus seats where we decided how we're going to change our business model so that we have nothing but space. It, those, the front of that bus has been magical for the two of us being cooped up together. That's answer number one. Answer number two, <clears throat> when you get to, let's say a, a campsite and you're in the mountains and it's beautiful and it's peaceful and there's a little stream over there and you, you pull up and, and you open up the bus, you kind of set up, it takes about 10 minutes to set up and your wife brings you a drink and you make a little fire and you can't get DoorDash. So you, you make some, you know, some food on the fire or whatever. Just the two of you hanging out like that, sometimes bad reception. So people can't get a hold of you. You got no choice, but to continue dreaming, hanging out, spending time together. And there's something reciprocal about I drove all day. She's making dinner, making me a drink. Um, there's something reciprocal about us working together to create this radically different life. Now, talk to us in five years, might not want to do it. I have a hunch though, this will be a great big part of our life forever going forward. Well, it's interesting because what you're creating is variety within your relationship. You know, we took, uh, before we moved to California, Kim and I, as you know, we took four months to live in Europe. And some of those places we lived in Europe are weird fucking places like Montenegro, like the former Yugoslavia. And being in those places, the Wi-Fi wasn't so good. Walking up the steps, it took, you know, 150 steps to get up to the top. But what it did do is when I look back, it is some of the best times in our lives together as a couple because we had to approach different facets of each other, which I think you guys are doing now, because when was the last time you did anything like this, which is probably never. And now what's interesting to me is you're not doing it for a weekend. You're doing it like a month at a time. You were gone when your dad passed and you came back, like how, what's your longest time on the road? How long have you been? Probably in the motorhome, six weeks, but we were okay. home away from home for seven weeks when dad died. And when you were gone for those six weeks, were you excited about coming home or was it like, I, I want to do another month? Like, where were oh, you? I, with I that? didn't want to come home. I was depressed. I was sad. I looked over at Lori and I said, I'm, I love our home. This has been my dream home for, for a long, long time. I don't mean the physical structure. I mean, where we live here in Santa Monica has been my dream home for nine years. Um, and I was legit sad. I looked at her and I said, I'm sad. I'm sad to be home. And I want to get right back on the road. And we couldn't. Reality was we couldn't. You know, we, we still have things to do. We still have responsibilities. But I was downright sad that I had to come home. And we've taken two long trips, a six-week one and then a five-week one. Both times that I pulled that thing up in front of the house, I said, I don't want to be here. I want to be right back on the road. As we record this right now today, I want to be on the road. I don't want to be, I, I want to be talking to you, but I want to be talk, talking to you from the bus. Because by the way, we still work from the bus. It's not like we're doing nothing. 
You know what I mean? We're still having conference calls. Lori's still raising 2 million bucks for her company. Like we kicked ass from the bus in a way we did better. We were only doing mission critical things because that's all that we could fit in. Right. Well, you're, you know, look, your bus is as big as my home. Your <laughs> bus has a podcast studio. Like you're, you know, like don't, don't feel sorry for poor Chris. Like he is, uh, he, he's living like a rock star in that. Um, Okay, so you mentioned earlier that you are um, going to be changing locations, and you're open to uh, sharing that. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this next giant major decision of your life, which is to leave um, a place that you loved. Um, you you know you came out here from the Midwest, um, and uh, just when I figured out how to get my ass out here, you decided to abandon me. I have um, a lot see, of guilt around that, my friend. My, 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 uh, my th- th- look, this is my mother's victim mentality coming out, right? You're leaving me. You're leaving me mm-hmm. like a wolf mm-hmm. in the streets. Um, tell me, uh, tell me more about, um, and you don't have to get crazy with politics or any of that, but just give me a little bit about why you're leaving and where you're going and, and what you sort of see for this next stage of uh, your life. The first reason we're leaving is it's built around this idea of space. Um, the, we're moving to Scottsdale area and the lot that we chose a home on is huge and it gives us expansive space and it feels safe. And the house itself on the lot is huge and expansive. And even the way that it's built with two courtyards and the way it's spread out, um, It's all about space and um, even the ability to leave. This will sound silly, but even the ability to leave from there versus getting out of LA is night and day. If we want to go on a trip in the bus, we have space. It's easy to get out of town. Here it's a pain in the ass. I don't have anywhere to park this thing when I want to load it. I've got, it takes you seven hours to get out of this damn state. Like it's impossible because your back is up against the ocean and it's overcrowded. So the first reason is it revolves around this idea of space. The second reason is this. Um, LA is not the LA that I fell in love with for the past nine years. For about the past 18 months, it's always had its quirks. It's always had its, its weird rules and it's, you know, horrible taxes and it's overcrowding and it's bad traffic. All of that was always here, except there was a return on investment. The skin in the game was being crowded. The skin in the game was having your neighbor's house sitting on top of yours. The skin in the game was, you know, paying $2,000 a square foot for a home. Uh, The skin in the game was being stuck, literally leaving two hours for for a meeting that's seven and a half miles away. And it used to be worth it. Now that return on investment is gone. Now I step, the homeless problem is so bad in, up, in upscale Santa Monica Brentwood that I step over human feces once every few weeks. That in our neighbor's yard, there's, there's homeless people that'll sit out on the easement and there's nothing they can do about it because they won't move them. Um, the, and, and don't take this as a lack of compassion. I do more for those causes than most people I know, but I don't need to live in it. Does that make sense? I don't need to be a part of it every single day. That chips away at my happiness. Um, It's not safe here. When the riots happen in Santa Monica, they have it on my street. And I think we're gonna head into 2021 being another year of a lot more unrest. And so I don't care to be running to the mountains again like I had to when that happened. The taxes have become absorbent and they're going up. And there comes a point, I love when people say, oh, aren't you happy to pay your fair share? I love paying taxes. I've done podcasts on how you should view paying taxes as a privilege, but not to a state that continues to abuse its small pool of taxpayers and not tap into anybody else to chip in and then piss it all away with mismanagement. At some point, you got to say, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go where I can preserve my dollars and go put them to work for the same causes where I get to dictate where they go, not where the government's just literally burning them. Um, California's on the decline, man. It's on the decline and the return on investment for all the effort it took to live here is not there anymore. And like an investment or like a relationship, if you continue to stay in an abusive relationship, 
Or if you continue to stay in an investment where it's going down and down and down and down and you don't take your money out because you think maybe one day it'll go back up, then pretty soon you start looking like a fool. And that's where we're at with this. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I've, I've heard uh, Adam Carolla talk about how, um, you know, California is like the crazy ex-girlfriend that you go, oh, that bitch is crazy. Like I need to get, I need to get out of here, but the sex is so damn good that it's, yep. that it's hard to leave. That's and a great it's great analogy. That's what this is. <laughs> 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 which is what it is. So right now I'm enjoying the sex, but I, but I think it's, I think at some point I'm going to be out there uh, somewhere else. Um, okay. So um, I want to poke around just some random questions on uh, the world of fulfillment and maybe how you're doing things um, a bit differently. What is one thing that you have not gotten to in life that if you didn't get to it, you would have massive regret. Like this is the one thing, like I haven't gotten this damn thing yet and I want it. And if I don't have it, I am going to be regretful. What's that one thing? Starting a family. We keep kicking that can down the road. Um, and I know that there will be a day where if I grow old without one, I will regret that more than anything else. Um, okay. And so we're, we're making that a priority. Uh, of course, you got to create space to make that a priority. And here's the problem. We've been so goddamn fulfilled and happy that there's never been this space to fill. There's never been a, a moment where like, hey, maybe we should do this to make us happier. Hey, maybe we're missing something. Hey, maybe, literally, we've, we haven't been missing anything. Matter of fact, our curse, going back to your question, when you said, um, you know, hey, what, what is it like the two of you cooped up in a bus for six weeks? Our curse is that you could put us on an island, just the two of us, and as long as we had projects to work on, we'd be happier than a pig and shit. But when that's the case, then it becomes very easy to not stop and pause and say, wait a minute, forward thinking, I better get around to kicking a couple ankle biters out or something like that, or we're not going to have the opportunity. <laughs> what do people often get wrong about you? Get rich, chase money. Um, you know, if, if you're not doing well in life, then, then you're a failure. I think that's what they think my message is before they know me. And it couldn't be further from the truth. The reason that I teach that you have an obligation to go out and create as much wealth as you possibly can is because of things like when dad died, without thinking twice about it, I was able to go from the mountains of Big Bear, California to a private jet in 120 minutes to home four hours later and be with my mom. And I was able to say, who cares about the funeral? Let's get that covered. Um, I was able to have the, the, the wherewithal to say, hey, team, you go handle all this business for the next seven weeks. I'm just staying here and being with my mom. Like to be able to support your loved ones is why I preach that you need to go out and you have an obligation to create as much financial freedom as possible. And then when I look around at the number of causes right now that need funding to make this world a better place, you can't look left, you can't look right, you can't look up, you can't look down without seeing somewhere where somebody needs you to fund a cause that you care about. If we continue down this path where only a very small few people are trying to fund the things that need to be fixed and everyone else is saying, ah, not my problem, or oh, I don't have the money for it then nothing's going to get fixed. This world's going to continue to become a really shitty place. But if everybody lived up to their potential and had some abundance to kick in towards whatever cause turned them on, we'd have enough to go around to solve every damn problem that we face. For sure. If you think about all the unrest, if you think about all the things going on right now, it all boils down to money. There's either money to fix it or there's not. Okay, different question. What is your guilty pleasure? Alcohol. Alcohol. Um, and it's, here's the funny thing. I'm trying so hard not to drink as much as I used to. You and I were talking about yesterday. I love an old bottle of wine, like an 82 Bordeaux or something. You know, my, our mutual friend, Chris King has got me turned down some stupid bottles of wine. I love a, a six or $800 bottle of, of scotch or whiskey. I love um, things that kind of bring you off into a different world and you get that little buzz and there's history around you actually experiencing something that most people wouldn't experience. Problem is that I wake up the next day and I feel like garbage and not hungover garbage, but like foggy garbage, lacking that, that thing that makes me me garbage. Um, 
And so that's probably the perfect definition of guilty pleasure. I feel guilt even while I'm doing it saying, ah, I'm not going to feel good tomorrow, but boy, it's pleasurable right now. So that you have a, uh, as they say in the biz, you have a heart out. So I am going to ask you my final question and we'll change things up. What one question would you like to ask me? Rob, every time we get together, you have a new breakthrough, something that a friend of you taught you. You, you, yeah. You've probably said it four times in this interview. You said, well, Jonathan had this brand new way of me looking at problems. And Darren has this brand new way of me looking at this. And what is something that somebody's passed on to you recently that has completely shifted the way you see the world and made your life better? We have become as a culture, probably because of social media feeding us more information that we're interested in, the same information that we're interested in. We have not been open to an opposing opinion. And we've become very, very boring as people because either we're Republicans or we're Democrats or we're this or we're that. And this sort of idea of not being open to somebody who does something completely differently than you or believes something completely different than you is dangerous. It's dangerous for yourself. It's dangerous for the world. Um, and it's not a very sexy look. In fact, the people that I find to be the most interesting people are the ones that you probably know that they have a different of a, difference of opinion, but they're curious about what your opinion is. And they're certainly not making you wrong for feeling that way, or they're certainly giving you grace for, you know, being open to persuasion. Um, and I just think that, um, I, I can be very opinionated in how I feel about something and not open to a different way. And I'm, I, I think that that is the next thing that I'm working on in my life, which is just allowing a completely different opinion. You, you know, you're, you, you want Trump. Great. Why you want Biden? Okay, great. Why you, you, you want to, you want, you don't want any of this. You want socialism. Okay, great. Why? And not, you know, this big giant fuck you for thinking, thinking differently. Like Darren said, he said, Rob, one of the reasons why I love you is because you're so fucking opposite me. I don't need one more me. I don't need one more CEO to hang out with to just give me more of me. I need somebody who's, you know, spending his days surfing at the beach or loves DJing or loves house music or like these weird things that you do. I don't talk, you talk. You know what I mean? Like I love the opposite. So long answer, but that's, that's how I would answer it. No, I love that. And I, I think I've realized this and I, I hope that everybody else starts to try and, and exercise this same thing you're talking about. I think the happiness you're seeking is on the other side of being way more open than you are right now. Close, being closed-minded is a guaranteed way to stay the same as what you are right now. So if you're a six out of 10, if you're a seven out of 10, if you're an eight out of 10, being closed-minded is a guaranteed way to stay there or less. Being open-minded, the, the pursuit of maybe I don't know what I don't know that could radically change my life is the only real shot you have at exponentially growing your happiness scale. Brother, I cannot thank you enough for, uh, for doing this, for being in my life. I love you. Um, and um, I am really excited to see what Chris 3.0 is going to be uh, coming up. I, 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 it's, it's now 3.0 for me. I like that. So, well, listen, number one, I love you right back, my friend. And number two, I think everyone should know this. When we had lunch yesterday, I'm going back to where you made me feel guilty for moving out of here, right? When you moved here, we said, this is important for everyone. We said every 30 or 45 days, we're never leaving one date without not having the other date scheduled. And that's what you have to do to maintain relationships like this. And when I talked about, you know, making my loved ones a priority and, and me doing that for dad, and that's why I don't have any shoulda, coulda, wouldas around dad. That's what I'm going to do with friends like you. And so I think other people should take that page and, and stick it in their book as well. I love that, buddy. I know you got to get out of here, so I'm going to let you go. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Yeah. Um, I would say this. In 2021, to avoid, we're going to take a, a term from our mutual friend, Christine Hassler, to avoid an expectation hangover, I would stop expecting things to go back to what you think normal was 
And instead, I would be on a quest for what a brand new normal could look like for you. And it might deliver you the best life yet. Boom. We're going to drop the mic on that. That was perfect. Buddy, thanks again. And uh, we'll link up to uh, everything that you're doing in the show notes. Love and appreciate you, man.